Hi everyone, in this video I'll talk about the semantics of the language of propositional logic. In previous video I've covered the symbols and syntax of this language. Uh, in this video I'll talk about the semantics or how the various symbols and formulas in the language of propositional logic are assigned truth values. So thus far the language of propositional logic as it's been articulated is just a set of symbols or an alphabet and rules for putting those symbols together in well-ordered ways. Uh, but with this said, these symbols and the formulas that result from applying these grammatical rules or formation rules are meaningless. They don't have any significance. So the way that these single symbols as well as the combination of these symbols get their meaning is by being interpreted. That is, they're some, they have a semantics which gives them their meaning. But before talking about the semantics of the language of propositional logic, it's helpful to introduce the general notion of a function. And here I'll do that in a somewhat casual way. So what is a function? Uh, a function is a specific kind or type of relationship between two types or groups of things. The first group of things is known as the function's domain, and it's composed of objects or members known as the function's inputs or arguments. The second group of thing that the um, that can, is found in this relationship is known as the range, and it's composed of the objects or members known as the function's outputs or values. The relationship of the inputs to the outputs is such that each input is related to one and only one output. So the notion of a function is just a type of relationship between two sets or collections of things, the inputs and the outputs, such that each input is related to one and only one output. So let's look at some examples to get a clear sense of what a function is. So let's consider a function called the lightning color function. This function says that take any color as an input will relate it to an output which is simply a lighter version of that color. So we can think of let's say we had a color gray as input the output would be light gray or a lighter version of gray. If we had brown as the input or argument of that function the output would be light brown. One thing to keep in mind is a function need not only have one input we can have a set or group of inputs but what's important is that set or collection of inputs is related to one and only one output. Just to repeat this point, a function can have two or three or any number of inputs, but this set or collection can only be related to one and only one output. So let's consider uh, an example and let's call this the color emotion function that takes two colored items. You can imagine, let's say, pieces of clothing and these colors are the inputs and it relates it to one and only one output. Let's say it's an emotion and just to kind of keep the emotions, the number of emotions constrained, let's just say it relates it to either happy or sad. Let's define this color emotion function a little bit more specifically and just take the domain of items as blue and red and the output emotions as happy or sad. And so the co this color emotion function will say if the color input of both of the color items from the domain is blue, then the output emotion will be happy. If the color input of either of the colored items is red, then the output emotion will be sad. So here's a couple example and I've kind of filled in part of the function already. If we had two colored inputs and they're both blue, then the output would be happy. If we have one kind of color input which is blue and the other that is red, then the output is sad. In addition, if we have two color inputs, one's red and one's blue, according to this color motion function, then the output will also be sad. And if they're two red, we said that the color emotion function says that e if either of the color items is red, then the output is sad. So the output emotion here, again, will also be sad. So let's look at one more general example of a function before we talk about functions in the language of symbolic logic. So let's take a function that takes two colored and pattern rectangles as input. It'll take any kind of combination of colored and pattern rectangles as input, two of them, and produce a single rectangle as output. And this 
output will simply just be the overlay of the two inputs. Uh, since there are a number of, if we let the domain be any kind of possible colored and pattern, there'll be an infinite. So we'll just focus on uh, some specific ones here. So here's an example. We have two colored pattern rectangles. One is a blue square like looking figure with horizontal lines. The other is a square with red vertical lines and the so those are the inputs and the output is the sort of taking those two squares and putting them on top of each other. In this second example we have again two squares as input. The first has green diagonal lines and the second has red stars. Now these two inputs or this collection of two inputs is related to one and only one output and that's the overlay of the two patterns where there is a square with red stars as well as green diagonals. So what does this have to do with logic and more importantly what does it have to do with the semantics of logic? So the semantics of the language of propositional logic involve two important functions. The first function is what's called the interpretation function. Now this function takes propositional letters, single propositional letters as input, and assigns truth values to these propositional letters. So it'll take a propositional letter and relate it to one and only one truth value, either true or false. But we'll talk about more talk more about this in a second. The second function is known as the evaluation function. And this assigns a truth value to a well-formed formula depending upon the truth value of the propositional letters and the operators that compose that well-formed formula. So essentially this one takes the truth value of components of a formula and relates it to one and only one truth value as an output. So let's look at each of these. Now the interpretation function is a function that takes propositional letters as input and assigns them a single truth value true or false and we'll abbreviate this as T or F as output. To symbolize this interpretation function we could simply write I P equals T. This is to say that the interpretation of the argument or input P has a value or output of T which is true. Another way to read this is P, the propositional letter P, is true under the interpretation I. Now propositional letters can be interpreted in one of two ways. It can be interpreted as a single propositional letter can be interpreted as true and under a different interpretation it can be interpreted as false. So if we had a different interpretation, let's say it's I sub 2, then P could potentially be false under this interpretation. Now it's important to realize that an interpretation is an assignment of truth values to every propositional letter that is under analysis. Now there might be an infinite number of propositional letters in our language, but just when we go to analyze an argument or look at a set of formulas and kind of uh, assess that, we can just simply indicate the interpretation of each propositional letter we're interested in by simply writing IP equals true or IQ equals true and so forth and so on. So one question we may ask ourselves is how many interpretations are there for n distinct propositional letters? That is if I'm looking at an argument or a formula how many different ways can I assign truth and falsity to the propositional letters found in that formula? Well the answer to that is determined by the formula 2 to the n, where n is the distinct number of propositional letters. So for example, if there's one propositional letter, let's say it's p, there's two ways to interpret it. We can interpret p as true, or we can interpret p as false. For two propositional letters, let's say p and q, there's 2 to the 2 interpretations, that is four interpretations. That is, we can interpret P and Q as true, we can interpret P as true and Q as false, we can interpret P as false and Q as true, or we can interpret both P and Q as false. We'll talk a little more about this later, but I just wanted to point this out that we can 
use this formula to determine how many interpretations are required to give an exhaustive set of interpretations. Now I want to talk a little bit about the second important function involved in propositional logic semantics. If the interpretation function is used to determine the truth values of the different propositional letters, the evaluation function assigns a truth value to well-formed formulas on the basis of the truth values assigned to the propositional letters and the operators that are found in this well-formed formula. So let's look at how this is done. So for any interpretation, and we'll just say that this is I, we can define a valuation function of a well-formed formula in the language of propositional logic. And this is a function that assigns one and only one truth value to each well-formed formula in such a way. So let's look at some of examples. Now if R is interpreted in a a particular way, the valuation function doesn't change anything about this. It says if R, R is interpreted as true, then R is evaluated as true. Recall that the single proposition is a well-formed formula, and so for the valuation function, it leaves the truth value of the propositional letter alone. So if R is true, then under a particular interpretation, then the valuation of R is going to be true. If R is false, then the valuation also will be false. Where things get a little bit interesting is when, let's say we have a formula that is a negated formula. So let's say we have not P. Now this is defined that if the valuation of P is false, then the valuation of not P will be true. Next. How about the valuation of P and Q? Under what conditions is this the case? What's the case if the input is such that both of the conjuncts, P and Q, are both true? That is, the valuation of P caret Q is true if and only if the valuation of P is true and Q is true. The valuation of P or Q, that is P V Q, is true if and only if one or the other or both of the disjuncts are true. That is, the valuation of P or Q is true if P is true or Q is true. Next, and we'll talk a little bit more about this one in another video, the valuation of P right arrow Q is true if and only if either P is false or Q is true, or both. That is, if you have a formula where the valuation of P is false, or the valuation of Q is true, then the valuation of the complex well-formed formula P right arrow Q will also be true. Finally, the valuation of P double arrow Q is true in one of, in either of two cases. In the case where both P is true and Q is true, or in the case where the valuation of P is false and Q is false. So if the interpretation function assigns truth values to all of the propositional letters, the valuation function does the what we might say the rest of the work by taking the assignment of truth values to those propositional letters and using them with various valuation rules to assign truth values to the well-formed formulas. And so you can think about it using this diagram. We have an interpretation, and what does it do? It takes every single propositional letter that we're interested in and assigns it a value true or false. Then we have the valuation function, and it will take those interpretations and use them associated with various valuation rules to assign a truth value, T or F, to every complex well-formed formula in the language. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this has been another video on the language of propositional logic. Like the video if you thought it was helpful, and subscribe if you're interested in seeing more videos on topics in logic. 